Well, this morning we are continuing this series of sermons that we started last week where we're asking the question, how do you know about some of the things we believe as Christians? In other words, how do we know the things that we say we believe are really worth believing? How do we know they're even true in the first place? Um, I think all of us probably wonder some of these things at some point, but we just get too scared to ask it in church because we think if I ask a question, then I'm not having faith and I'm not trusting God. But man, asking them is exactly what we're going to do in this series. We're going to tackle them head on because the fact is God's not afraid of our questions. And he is the answer, like we talked earlier. And our faith is built on a solid foundation, as we would find out if we just were brave enough to ask the questions and check out the answers. Um, like the one we asked last week, how do we know there really was a Jesus? Like historically, a lot of people question that these days. We can prove it easily. Even if we close the Bible and set it aside, we can still prove there was a Jesus very easily with other sources. Uh, how do we know he was resurrected? Again, we talked about that last week. Uh, the one we plan to tackle next week, how do you know you can trust the Bible? You know, how do we know it's historically accurate? Aren't there contradictions? What do we do with that? That's next week. And then today, this big one right here, it's kind of one of the first you have to answer if you're doing this series. How do you know God exists in the first place, right? Which is a question that I hear a lot of people asking in our culture these days, inside and outside the church. People are looking for hope, and uh, this crosses their mind at some point. And the good news is the answer to that question is actually fairly simple, um, if you ask me. We can know he's really there for three reasons, and thankfully I got them all to start with C this week. The third one's a little stretch, but at least they're close enough. So you can remember them easier, because they all start with C. And the first one is actually found in the Bible itself, in places like Psalm 19. Check it out, starting in verse 1 there. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. I love King David's poetry, don't you? Um, and that's one way we can know there's a God. Or to put it another way, as the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, he says, you know, the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of his divine being. So the first way we can know that there is indeed a God is simple. It's by creation, by looking at what he made. You know, the creation all around us points to a creator. And all you have to do to see that there is a creator is look at the creation around you. I mean, consider what Psalm 19 talks about here as just one example we could use, right? As, and the heavens got created. In other words, the universe itself, right? What are some ways the universe declares to us there is a God? Well, back in 1929, this really cool scientist named Edwin Hubble, who the telescope is named after, he's looking at the stars and doing his thing, and he notices that over time, the stars he's watching are getting farther and farther apart. Galaxies he can see are getting farther apart. You can do this experiment yourself if you don't believe him. Map stars, get a telescope, and watch. Over time, they get further and further apart. And as a scientist, he realized, okay, that means something important. That means the universe is actually expanding, right? Even as we sit here right now, kind of like a balloon. That's why we gave you guys balloons this morning. If you're watching at home, you missed out. You should have been here. All right, so take your balloon for a second and take your pen and let's try something real quick. Uh, don't, don't poke holes in it, but draw very, very tiny dots, just a few dots on your balloon. Start with that. Dot, dot, dot. I didn't bring a pen, but oh, you guys have them, so go for it. No, it's okay. Uh, a couple of dots. Okay, now after you draw a few dots without poking holes in it, now blow up your balloon and then hold it when it's full of air. And if you are not a good balloon blower up or find someone near you who is and let them help you film. Okay, stop and hold it just like that once you get it blown up a little bit. They're hard. You got you to give it some oomph, man. 
All right, so you got your balloon. Okay, now notice something, or at least theoretically notice it in your mind if you couldn't get it to work. As you blew up the balloon, what happened to the dots? Right? They got a little bigger and they got farther apart. It's the same idea with the universe. Those dots are like the stars. And that, as they're getting farther apart, Edwin Hubble goes, okay, that must mean the universe is like a balloon. It's slowly expanding. Okay, now I know y'all want to do it, so on the count of three, go ahead, just let them go. Ready? One, two, three. Ah, that's so much fun. Okay, back to the universe. All right, so here is the thing. Um, so imagine we took a video of you blowing that balloon up. Okay, like here's one, here's one of me. Okay, so here's a video of me blowing up a balloon. Here it goes. Whee! Okay, and then we stopped. Imagine you stopped the video right there. Okay, and then you said, you know what? I'm going to play it backwards. What would you see? You'd see the balloon getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So imagine this. Imagine if you could somehow, if we had recorded the universe expanding since it first started expanding, and we could stop the video and actually watch it backwards, high speed, because it would obviously take a while. But if you could watch a video of the universe expanding backwards, what would you see? You'd see the universe getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you go back far enough, it would get a, to a point where it was so small, it, it couldn't get any smaller, right? At some point, it becomes this little bloop, and that's the end. Which told Edwin Hubble and other scientists the universe had to have a beginning because there's some point at which it can't get any smaller. Now, there have been theories over time that have been thrown out there, like, well, maybe the universe is always just in a state of expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting, but those have been disproven. We, we got to the chance to talk to a really smart science guy who knows way more than I ever will about this, and I asked him that question. And uh, Stephen C. Meyer, author of uh, Darwin's Doubt, head of the uh, Discovery Institute up in Seattle, he goes, that was disproven in the 80s. Anybody still throwing that theory out there is way behind because there's not enough dark matter. The ratio of dark matter in the universe is not proportionate to that theory to work. If you don't understand that, I don't totally either, but that's the answer, if someone throws that shit. Okay, so anyway, that doesn't work. So we know the universe had to have a beginning. The smartest science people I work with at the aquarium, people who know more than maybe even them about this, will tell you, no, we're sure the universe had to have a beginning. Now in science, they call that the big what, students? Big Bang, exactly, Big Bang, not just a TV show, it is actually a theory. Uh, which, believe it or not, is actually a great theory in my opinion, because it helps me prove the existence of God, and I'll tell you exactly why. Because here's the thing, if there was a beginning to the universe, there's only two possible causes for that, right? Don't overthink this, here it is. Either something caused it, or nothing caused it, right? <laughs> it's not rocket science. It is a little bit of astronomy. But if the universe had a beginning, Either something caused it or nothing caused it, right? Now, if nothing caused it, case closed, game over, go home, life is meaningless. But in science, logic, philosophy, ask a four-year-old, is it even possible when there's nothing somewhere for nothing to cause something? Of course not. Nothing is there to cause it, right? So something had to have caused the Big Bang. So think about this for a second. If you take away the universe, right? And this is gonna like stretch your brain, but try to go with me for a second. Think about what goes away if you delete a universe from the equation, right? Everything, everything you know. Think about it, nature goes away, time goes away. Why do we have time? Because planets are doing this in the universe. Universe is gone, no time, no nature, no us. A lot of things disappear. So that means whatever it was that caused the universe had to be able to exist without everything it created, right? Because it made it. Does that make sense? Right? You know, you have a kid. Obviously, you existed before the kid, so you are ex able to exist without the kid, okay? You create a you know, cheesecake bite. Obviously, you were able to exist before that cheesecake bite without that cheesecake bite because you made it. So whatever caused the universe had to be able to exist without what it created. So that means, for example, that whatever caused the universe had to be able to exist without nature. So just in the simplest form of the word, that means it had to be supernatural, right? We think of, oh, supernatural, God. Well, time out, just, just go with the definition of that word. It had to be able to exist without nature. So it had to be supernatural, right? It also created time. So it had to be able to exist before time, without time, outside of time. It had to be eternal. Whatever this thing was had to be able to exist without time or nature because it created them. Then if you get into things like physics or you even just look at your DNA, right? Get a microscope. Go down to the smallest part of you that's all over the place and you find DNA, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid. 
which is, long story short, information. And where does information come from? I mean, if you logged on to check your Facebook or your Twitter or your Instagram today and your friend posted something funny, did you read that and go, wow, random chance did it again, oh my gosh. Somehow, out of nothing, these words and letters put themselves together in the form of a joke that made me laugh. What are the odds? Of course not, that would be stupid. You go, hey, my friend posted that. Because you know, information comes from intelligence, right? Comes from a brain. So whatever designed all this DNA that's everywhere had to be intelligent in the simplest form of the word. So think about this and add up just those three factors because there's plenty more we could talk about, but just those three. And you get a cause for the universe that had to be supernatural, eternally existent, and intelligent. And you tell me what that sounds like. Some empty void that doesn't give, you know, care about you at all? No, it sounds a lot like the way the Bible describes God, if you ask me. And my guess, just my logical scientific guess as someone who works for one of the top science institutions in the world, where our director of science is a Christian, by the way, my guess is the Big Bang Theory is just science's version of Genesis 1-1, the first verse in your Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, let there be light. Boom, there was light. Sounds like what they see. Well, time out, Matt, you might say, and I know Scott will say this to me later, so I'll just tack it down. Time out, Matt. Just a few weeks ago, before Stephen Hawking died, he said he didn't believe there was anything before the Big Bang because you wouldn't need anything before the Big Bang if you think in terms of imaginary and real time. Here's, here's what Hawking said. He says, one can regard imaginary and real time as beginning at the South Pole which is a smooth point of space-time where the normal laws of physics hold, right? You got the South Pole. There's nothing more south of the South Pole. And like that, clearly, in his opinion, there was nothing around before the Big Bang. So what do we do with big, brainy science guys that say stuff like that? Well, again, I'm not going to claim to be nearly as brilliant as him in the area of physics, but I will gladly quote another physicist named Hugh Ross who responded to his idea like this. He said, you know, quote, while Hawking was correct that time had a beginning, nevertheless, the beginning of time still demands a cause that was capable of creating time independent of time. It's not enough to simply speculate that imaginary time exists, right? You have to have something that can create time for time to exist. And Ross goes on to say, you know, not just Hawking's model, but all cosmological models that seek to avoid the need for God require that the point where the universe begins is smaller than an electron, uh, that, that has to be large. But our recent observations out into space and stuff that show that, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, he didn't say stuff, uh, showing that images of distant quasars and blazars, those are not blurry, they're sharp. And they constrain the size of these quantum space-time fluctuations. That sounds like something from Star Trek. Uh, the fluctuations are not large enough, here's the point, What we see, basically, is not large enough to escape the need for a creator who creates space and time or for the universe to have a finite age. In other words, you can theorize all you want and try to talk you and all your science buddies out of the need for God, but the fact is you will always come back to the need for a creator, no matter what you try to theorize about. So the first way we know there's a God is what we can learn from creation itself, which the Bible actually encourages you to do. Just look around, man. Study stuff. It always blows my mind if you look at where the Earth is in our solar system, in our galaxy. We are in the perfect spot to study space. There's nothing in between us and wide open space. The odds of that, if it's an accident, I don't think so. I think we were meant to study this stuff. And I think that's really cool. So the first way we can know is creation. Second way we can know is consciousness. Human consciousness, what do I mean by that? The fact that we can even have a discussion about this, right? The fact that you can argue with someone about the existence of God or even try to understand this stuff, the fact that you have a mind and a will that you chose to come here today unless someone dragged you, you know, still you have a will you chose, you have an identity, the fact that any of that exists in you means you have what we call a human consciousness, okay? And here's the thing. If there were no God, if atheists are right and all that exists is what's physical, how do you explain human consciousness, right? Because I can do surgery on someone and open their head up and see their physical brain, but a brain does not equal a mind, does it? Uh, Dead people have brains, okay? There's something else there that's non-physical. And if you bring this up to an atheist, they don't have an answer. It's actually called the problem of mind in atheist philosophy. 
The human consciousness, there's no way they can explain how if it's only a physical material universe, there's only things in this universe you can see, touch, and feel, then how do you have thoughts? How do you have emotions? How do you have human consciousness? Because I can't see, touch, or feel that. And they don't know what to do with it. You only have two options, right? Either we totally reject the idea that we have consciousness as some kind of illusion, and that's, that's the way atheists will go. But the funny thing about that is you're using your consciousness to reject it. You're using your consciousness to say it's not there. That doesn't make any sense. That's the best they've got, though. Or option two, you have to accept, man, there are non-physical things in this world that you can't explain apart from another non-physical cause, right? A non-physical cause that just maybe made us in his image. That's why we have a non-physical consciousness. Genesis says that's how God did it. Because he didn't just make us, he made us in his image. So if you have this non-physical being with a non-physical consciousness who makes people in his image, then it would follow we'd have a similar consciousness that you can't explain by just physical things. Makes sense to me. Number two, human consciousness. Second reason why I believe there's God, simple. And on to number three, it's because of context. Okay, now I said I had to stretch this a little bit to fit a C word, but uh, what I mean by that is the way life tends to just work out if you look at it from an eternal perspective, okay? Now, if you get stuck in the moment in what you're going in, why did this doesn't make sense, whatever. But how many times have we been there and later down the road looked back and gone, oh, I see, it all makes sense. Oh, I see how that fits in with everything, right? That's the idea. Because here's the thing. Every so often you'll hear someone say something like this. This is a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson, big-time science atheist, says this. He goes, you know, every description of God I've heard says that God is typically all-powerful and all-good. And he says, and then I look around and I see all these different tragedies, and I say, I just don't see evidence of both of those being true simultaneously. If there is a God, he's either not all-powerful or he's not all-good, but he can't be both. Ever heard that? That's called theodicy in theology. It's nothing new. and People have been arguing about that for centuries. And it sounds good and convincing until you think about it for that long and you realize, well, what if there's a third option that he's totally ignoring, right? And that's this. We put it on your, on your <coughs> notes pages there. From a great Kukul, who's an apologist and author, uh, he says it so well in his book, The Story of Reality. Great book. If you ever want just a basic book that explains Christianity and what it's about just so well, that is, that is a fantastic book. But this one part, he says, okay, check it out. The statement, a good God always prevents evil as far as he's able to, is simply false. Instead, it is far more accurate to say that a good God always prevents suffering and evil unless he has a good reason to allow it. Circle, underline, highlight, okay? Sometimes God might allow an evil because it will prevent a greater evil. Sometimes he might allow evil because it will produce a greater good. I'm not saying evil can be good, but rather that there may be good reason to allow bad things. Allowing some evil for a time, for example, may result in a better world in the long run than a world that never had evil to begin with. That certainly is plausible. God is not obligated by his goodness to use his power to prevent all evil in every circumstance, but he may have morally sufficient reason to allow it in some cases. It's often hard for us to see how the bad thing God permits in the present could ever bring a greater good in the future. But that's because we don't know the future or the infinitely complex set of events that fall like dominoes from our lives into the lives of others. It's kind of a different example, but I think it's in the book, The Problem of Pain. C.S. Lewis makes this great analogy. He says, you know, so many times we get hung up just in our little worldview. And we think, oh, my birthday's coming Saturday. God, I pray it doesn't rain. I pray it doesn't rain. I pray it doesn't rain. And then it rains. And you're like, what the heck, God? I didn't want it to rain for my birthday. And we never step back and go, yeah, but the farmer who's trying to feed his family down the street was praying it would rain. And you're just all about you. And he needs to feed his family, so I'm going to give him the rain he needs. And we get so caught up in our little world, and we go, whoa, if I step back and look at this from God's perspective, what's it really all about? Besides, and I love this point, we didn't put this on there, but again, get the book, uh, Story of Reality. Kugel goes on, he says, you know, the other thing about that is nothing is really solved by getting rid of God anyway. Well, there's pain and suffering, so there must not be a God. Okay, but realize the problem of pain and suffering is still there, right? 
Uh, as he says, removing God from the equation does nothing to eliminate the problem that caused you to doubt his existence in the first place. God is gone from your equation, but the original problem is still there. The world is still broken, and atheism has nothing to help with on that matter. So what's the atheist supposed to do then? Nothing's changed. Things are still not the way they're supposed to be. So the atheist continues to be plagued with the same problem he started with. But given a godless physical universe, the idea that things are not as they should be, that makes no sense. Because how can something go wrong when there was no right way for it to be in the first place? And there can't be a right way without God. Hmm. By contrast, however, this guy named Doug Gruthius, who's just been through, you ever say, well, these guys, what have they been through? Read his story. This guy's been through a lot. And he says, you know, the resources of the Bible, the Christian worldview, those give us wisdom for living through suffering better than any other worldview. Because the themes of creation, fall, and redemption, which are rooted in reality, and because of the suffering and resurrection of Christ, we're able to actually suffer better than those of any other worldview. Everyone's going to suffer. But he says, you know, the resources that God gives us as Christians enable us to suffer better. Like Jesus says, you build your life on me, storms are still going to beat against your life, but you'll make it through. You won't collapse. I was reminded of one huge example of exactly that this past week. Uh, some of you guys will remember the Davis family, Sarah and JD. And, and uh, there, there's this amazing military family that was part of our church a few years ago. And, and we know military families are never ours to keep. You know, they come for a while, they, they do their thing, and then the military moves them on. And so we just try to invest in them while they're here and send them out in style and, uh, when we get one. But, um, but the Davis family, J JD, Sarah, Kenny, and Dez, they, they've since moved to Georgia with the military. Um, but man, they're one of many families that I would take back in a heartbeat if the military ever brought them back. And if you guys are watching, I'm just saying, you know, come back. We'd love you guys. Uh, but long story short, the Davis family went through a lot in the years surrounding their time here with us and in the years they were here with us. And, um, but the way God got them through all of it and, and the way he even used those tough times and that's just been one more proof of his existence to me and exactly what we're talking about in point three. But I'm not going to steal their thunder. I'm going to let them tell you their own story. Uh, they actually go to this like giant mega church now back in Georgia. And they got to share this on Easter last Sunday. They sent us the link. I'm like, that's so good. I got to show that at SCC, even if like 90% of the people won't know. The four of you that will remember them, this is awesome. Uh, but uh, anyway, watch this. My name is JD. I grew up in a military family. But I was a typical boy into sports. Eventually, grabbed a hold of music. That was my main focus. And I wanted to be the best guitar player in the world. So I focused on music and playing music and um, didn't really have much of a spiritual life whatsoever. Dad and my mom, they, at a certain point, they thought that maybe I was taking the music too far and took me to church. Uh, I think more so to fix me. They, they were doing what they thought was best, but they weren't necessarily Christians themselves. Eventually, one day, uh, I met, which would be my future wife, Sarah. Two years later, after meeting her, uh, we got married. From there, I, I continued the music career. Uh, I put a lot of focus into music still. I do feel like all the while, God was kind of giving me hints that this is not the plan that he necessarily had for me. I ignored those signs and kept going and kept going. Eventually, one day, I did receive a record contract, and I believe God really put me in a position where I needed to choose God and family or my music career. And so I chose my family, because, I, and I think God knew that. So after the music career collapsed, I started to get convicted about the sin and the life that I'd lived before. I knew that if it came out, that it would upset everybody. Well, after years of uh, resisting this conviction, I confessed my sins and it did collapse my family. And I was devastated. My wife and I separated for some time. It brought me to the lowest point of my life. But one day, someone decided to say, hey, you want to come to church with me? I said, sure, I'll, I'll go and I'll listen. I can never be those Christians. I can never live that, 
that like, I'm not one of those people who goes to those churches, but I will listen to it to see what I can get out of it. And whenever I went to church, I was just overwhelmed by God's grace and his mercy. He, be, he came into my heart that day and came into my life and said, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the lies that you told. I'm here and I love you and you're my son. And I just broke down and cried. I had the snot, I had the tears. It was all there. This was me feeling freedom for the first time. And I gave my life to Jesus. It did seem too good to be true, but it was true that he loved me and I was a child of God. It was overwhelming. What could I say? <laughs> my name is Sarah. Um, as a child growing up, I did not have, grow up in a home that was very religious. I sought a lot of different religions, Wiccan, Buddhism, everything. Um, the whole Christian thing didn't seem like it was definitely for me. It really seemed like, um, I don't know, that's just what the norm was going with. As I hit teen years, it was all about everything rebellious, drugs and alcohol and rock and roll and everything you weren't supposed to be involved in. Um, I did get pregnant at 15 and became a mom. I continued to just go to school and graduate and you know work real hard and take care of my son but I met my husband at 18 and um, he was bona fide rock star <laughs> um, so we were married by 20 had a child of our own um, you know we were trying to raise a family but also you know he was a rock star and I was trying to support his rock star lifestyle and one day he decided um, after getting a record contract that he was going to um, uh, not go with the record contract. I decided to support him in that because I had supported him in everything else. After after quitting music, we decided, both of us put all of our focus on the family and the kids at that point in time. So about a year after, he comes to me uh, with a complete bomb and just confesses everything that had happened over the years. Um, that he confessed adultery and everything and I had to swallow that pill. At first I thought it was going to be great. I was like, no, it's okay. We'll make it through this. We've made it through so much. It's no big deal. But then as time went on, I started to grow bitter. I was so angry and bitter that I could, I mean, my life literally was falling apart for me at that point in time. Um, after a year of being bitter, you know, I did leave him. I was completely miserable for that six months. <laughs> it was the worst six months of my life. I remember getting this book, just trying to be a better mom. I got this book and I didn't know who the, who the author was, but she was a Christian author. And um, she, uh, the one big takeaway I took from the book was that um, our husbands are also just somebody else's son. And at that point in time, I started to think of everything my son had, or my husband had done. And I, forgiveness just completely came over my heart. So I went back to him and told him that I loved him and I wanted to work it out. Um, he had joined the military while we were separated. So um, we got back together, sent him off to basic training, and we reunited again in California. He decided that we should try and find a church because he had been going to church while we were separated. Um, I agreed and I found a pastor who knew all the facts and was giving them to me, but for some reason the facts did not matter in that sermon. The pastor spoke the name of Jesus over me, completely knocked down the walls around my heart. The Holy Spirit just came into my heart. Uh, Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. and. God was real, Jesus was real, and there was no disputing it. I completely broke into tears. It had everything to do with Jesus. Years, my wife and I are back together, um, and we our marriage is renewed and restored, um, stronger than it ever has. This sounds kind of, I, it does seem too good to be true. Mm -hmm. I just think to myself, I, I don't deserve that. And I kind of get scared in my heart a little bit. I have a little bit of fear, but the Lord just reassures me, whether it's through scripture or it's through the church body or it's through my wife um, encouraging me, 
that everything's going to be okay and to take that leap of faith and step out and and so that way he can show me that he loves me because it takes me stepping out in faith for him to have the opportunity to show us that he loves us and cares for us and will be there to guide us. Um, the Lord did completely knock down our old life and rebuilt it from the ground up. And we are living a completely different life and lifestyle than I ever even imagined. I tell JD all the time, honestly, how um, I literally, we literally are living a better life than I ever even dreamed for myself. And it hasn't been perfect. Just a few months after being saved, my, uh, my mom committed suicide. And I really feel like that was, um, I was very new in my faith for whatever reason, compl instead of getting caught up in my hurt, I just turned to God and I just reached my arms out for him and begged for him to help me with that. And I truly felt a sense of peace come over me when I, when I turned my eyes to the Lord in that situation, I truly felt like the Lord was cradling me and comforting me and holding me and I felt complete peace in that situation. It's only been four years, but there's a lot of, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's amazing. So maybe you might be thinking that um, this, you know, forgiveness and Jesus and the Lord is too good to be true, but I'm here as a testimony and my husband is here as a testimony to say that um, it is real. God's love is so real mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. is not too good to be true. He loves us with all his heart and he wants us to come home to him um, as his children and uh, and just share his grace and his love with us. Amen. Let's pray again. With your eyes closed, heads bowed, nobody looking around, moving around for just for a second. You know, I love what Sarah said there about, uh, about SEC. Because um, it's true. I can give you all the facts in the world about God. And those facts are good and they're important. But ultimately, it's not until you finally surrender and get into your own relationship with God, that the facts matter, that, that you experience the heart and the life change that you need. And while as both of them said, you know, it does sound too good to be true that there is not only this amazing God, but he loves you, it is most definitely true. There is a God who loves you. In fact, he loves you so much, the Bible says he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to this earth. He put skin on 2,000 years ago to save you how do you do that? By coming to earth, living a perfect life we definitely didn't, and then taking on himself the responsibility and the help that we deserve for all the things we've done. Penalty, there's no way, if you really understand it, you would ever want to pay for yourself. Jesus took it for you. All the things that have brought us guilt and shame, the things we know God could and should punish us for, he took it on himself. That's what him dying on the cross is about. In fact, at Easter, sometimes you read the story and you see where Jesus says from the cross, it is finished. Man, that's it. As in, that's all that's needed. I did this for Matt. I did this for Amy. I did this for Ron, for Patty, for Scott. I did this for you. And that's all you owed. It's finished. It's covered. Then three days later, Jesus actually beats death itself, comes back to life and says, man, tell people the good news through what he did. You can be completely forgiven, have a new start, a new life, an eternal life, and peace with God, and, and everything that comes with that relationship, hope and joy and purpose, and man, it's all his gift, but have you ever accepted it? Because someone can spend the most money, they, they can spend everything they have on a fancy gift for you, but until you accept it, open it, and use it, it's not really yours. Have you ever done that? Jesus says you do it by repenting. It's a fancy word that means make a U-turn in life. Stop doing life your way and just surrender and turn around. And you don't even have to come 50 feet back to God. He will run to you and meet you right there where you turned around and change everything. He says, stop, make a U-turn, trust me to save you, and then follow my lead. Have you ever done that? If not, would you like to, man? Whether you're watching at home or you're sitting here, aren't you just tired of trying to do life your way? Isn't it just exhausting? <laughs> Why not surrender and let him lead you to the life he created you for? 
that you can only find in him. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. These aren't magic words. You don't even have to get them all right. It's just about what's in your heart. But if you'd like some help with what to say to God to make that happen, I invite you to pray with me. I'll say it slow. You can just say it back to him in your thoughts. This is between you and him, and he can hear those thoughts. I invite you to pray this with me. Dear God, I am sorry for the bad I've done. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and rising from the dead. Please, Jesus, come into my life and save me and take over and give me a new start. And thank you. Father, I pray for anyone at home or here that prayed that for the first time or maybe the tenth time they needed to come back to you. Whatever the case, God, please reassure them somehow that you heard them and uh, help them to, to make it real, to follow you, Jesus, from this point on. And thank you for what you've done for us. And Father, for all of us, oh my goodness, God, I've done my best to present these facts today, but like Sarah says, facts aren't all this is about. And I'm sure my sermon wasn't perfect, because I'm not perfect, but Holy Spirit, would you take these things we've talked about and help us not just understand them in our heads, but help, help use them to draw us closer to you, God, in relationship and deeper in our faith. Help us sink our roots in to the things we believe far beyond the surface and even share them with others. And thank you that our faith is built on a solid foundation. It's not a bunch of wishful thinking and fairy tales. It's stuff that actually makes sense and is real and is not too good to be true. And help us lead others to, to come to know you as well, God, as we live this stuff out and get it in our lives and share it. That's just, that's my prayer for us. To our awesome God, who most definitely does exist. <laughs> in Jesus' awesome name.